right. So we want to thank God for you being here tonight. And let's get right on it. Sometimes the um, greatest com controversy we're having now is, okay, when we come out of COVID, when we come out, when we hit the reset button, what's going to make you an employee that's valuable? Because in the Dream Church, you know, with the millennials and the young adults, um, there are some concerns with uh, seniors or uh, another generation uh, being concerned that we really may have kind of spoiled the, the generation coming up or we have inspired the generation coming up. We have made it a possibility to say, um, are you a desired employee? All of us need work. We all have to work. As a matter of fact, that's what the Lord has given us the ability and strength to do. That's what we call our seed source. So if we don't have jobs, how are we sowing seeds? And if we don't sow seeds, now we're not expecting a harvest. So jobs are extremely important. Do we ever take the time in church to really talk about that? Um, and now also I'm talking to those of you who are working. A lot of us are working from home, um, virtual. And that is, a, I, I just admire those of you who are able to maintain a full-time job and a full-time bed. I, I just, it's, it's amazing. You know, it's, I remember when people used to take, take off to go home. Now people get up to stay home. And it's just, it's an amazing thing. And even some of you are taking courses online. Times have certainly changed, and I admire those who have been able to change with it. That's why this Dream Church, you're going to keep hearing me say it, I, I think it's so important, and I think it's so impressionable, and it's so admirable that these young adults would say, Pastor, if this church is going to be able to sustain, um, we're going to have to start doing some things right now to make sure that that happens. And I appreciate that. And so that's what this service is dedicated to. We started last week talking about um, how are we going to be able to make ourselves valuable in a job. And we ended with the thing that we were saying, if you ever want to be in charge. Now, let me talk about being in charge. We have to remember, sometimes when people get in charge, they feel like they're in charge because all, they all they get a chance to do is say, no, 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 because I'm in charge. Um, no, when you're in charge, you got to remember that you have been given the, um, the task of being responsible for those under your charge. You're never in charge of people. Let's just make that clear before we even get started here. Sometimes when people get a position, uh, that seems to make you valuable. And your position should not, uh, <laughs> should, might, should not make you valuable because at some point, if somebody else gets that position, then you may tend to not feel valuable. So when you're a person that's in charge, you're responsible, responsible for those under your charge, meaning they should possibly be a reflection of your leadership. Um, and sometimes the members here have heard me talk about maybe those in healthcare. Sometimes when people feel overworked, it could be that some patients go without the care that they need because those at the top may be concerned about making, you know, the money that keeps the business going. But we have to make sure we take care of those that are under our charge so they can take care of those patients. And that goes even into the form of leadership in a church and everywhere else. So tonight we're going to continue to focus on if you ever want to be in charge. So if you ever want to be in charge, we have here uh, some slides. I'm going to keep those slides up. And the slide that you see now is a reflection of that. If you ever want to be in charge, and I'm going to go real fast because we did this last week. Number one, uh, we said, you know, do your job. If you ever want to be in charge, no, those slides are coming up. As soon as I say there, they should be right there. Okay, you have to do your job. Number two. You got to establish a relationship with your boss and the board. If you ever want to be in charge, establish a relationship. Number three, and I'm going real fast because we went over these last week. Um, discover your boss's style. For instance, I always talk about uh, I do. I, I like people to call and talk to me. I don't like to be communicated necessarily at first with just an email or text. Some bosses don't want you talking to them at all. And I use the word boss, and that's the word I just don't like, but I'll just use it because people are familiar with it. Discover his her style. Discover their style. Watch them. If your boss doesn't drink coffee, don't bring him for Christmas a box of mixed coffee. Okay? Know their style. If your boss is not a smoker, don't bring him a pack of, of cigars. And if your boss is a smoker, if you ever walk in and see your boss smoking, put water on him. He could possibly be on fire. It's going to be a long night. But anyway, discover his style. Watch him. Know what they like. And kind of, you know, that's how you can maybe make yourself um, a person that may be next in line for being in charge. And I'm saying this tonight because I feel like I'm talking to leaders. I'm not just talking to those of you who are working. You should be desired. When you're away from work, it should be a difference. Things should be, it's, they should miss you for a good reason. 
Okay, you should be admired and not just someone that says, well, she's hired. So th another reason that you if you ever want to be in charge, one of the things we talked about last week was influence your boss with your personal testimony. Talk good about the job and let it be accidentally overheard by other employees, because when you need a promotion, I guarantee you most people get promotions, not because the boss or the person in charge recognizes them, but other employees are overheard speaking of what a wonderful person that is, what great leadership that is. They listen. Bosses listen without letting you know they're listening um, to, to the way other people are under and around you speak of you. That's how they kind of get those tips. So we got these little tips going on here. So I just thought we'd throw that out there and influence the boss with your personal testimony by letting them know sometimes, you know, I really enjoy working here. This job has changed my life. Um, it has given me a great start. Uh, your product is good. Uh, the building is wonderful. Uh, the other workers here, I can tell they love it. You know, bosses and people in charge love to hear that they hired a person who still thinks that that job has I'm going to use this word because we're in a setting. That job has blessed them. You may go to your boss and tell him you're blessed, and he may not know what that means. But just tell him, I feel really honored to be working here. You know, break it down. You know your boss's style. If he doesn't understand speaking in tongue, don't go in there. Oh, God told me to tell you something today. You know, <laughs> but learn your boss's style. Okay, so, 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 okay, so we're here, and, and today I, uh, I want to start with this that we ended with last week, which I can't do it uh, without my team. I love the thought of people thinking that, well, you seem to do a lot, and da 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 And I think all of us do. The problem with that is most people don't ever see what's underneath, uh, beneath the, under the scene. I'm going to use this example again. You see the hood on the car, and it's all waxed, and it's all great, but sometimes you see the hood, and it's got dents in it from rain, hail, uh, scratches. But if you raise that hood up, the most important part of that car is the motor. But the motor is always covered. Yeah. And you got to understand, when you work on a job, you've got to know that you can't just do it without your team. And sometimes you may not like people on your team. And we'll get into that later on. Sometimes you could be disliked because you're doing the right thing. Sometimes people just hate you because you want to do things decently and in order. So I can't work without my team. I can't. So if we look at this plane here on this next slide, you'll see this is a plane, wonderful plane. It's an Air France plane, but I guarantee you it takes a whole team to make this thing fly. We're using this example because wherever you work, it takes an entire team to do whatever you do. I don't care how valuable you think you are. And I don't care how long you've been in leadership. And I don't care how many skills you have. And I don't care how much tenure you have. And I don't care how many people have voted you as employee of the year. And how many people say that you're the best thing that ever happened to them. It takes a team to make this fly. Also, if your plane, if your job, if something happens to crash, if things go wrong. Ha <laughs> ha. Check this out. It's up to me to keep things connected. Now, me being you, if you're the leader, see if you're the leader and you are because all you need is one person to follow you. So a, a slide ago, we saw this plane flying, okay? We saw this flying. The next slide, we saw this plane has landed. It wasn't designed to land on water. It's not a boat. But in case of an emergency and it could not get there, there's a movie uh, titled Captain Sully, Captain Sully, we were talking about that before we went on air. And this guy um, went under a lot of serious ridicule, accusations. They destroyed his character. You know, you have all these people on that plane. If you just keep that picture on that slide, because some of you have seen this before, but maybe not. If you see all these people on this slide, on this uh, plane, every single passenger survived. Every single crew member survived. Everyone aboard that plane survived. And one man, Captain Sully, was flying that plane. Now, I'm sure during all of his training, he never imagined one day having landed on water. But he did. Now, I'm showing this slide, and I want you to focus on it, because the plane was built with wings. But Captain Sully didn't build the wings. So whoever put those wings together had to realize, I'd better do my job right because other people's lives depend on it. Sometimes as a leader, you have to land, you have to make decisions that will get you criticized, uh, ridiculed, persecuted. But when that plane landed, 
and all of those people got out on those wings, they were still all able to be saved by a rescue boat because that plane was built to withstand water. It was built so that the wings would not go under if it was landed right. Now, it's up to you, it's up to me, it's up to us to keep things connected as leaders. When you're involved, your whole, with, uh, you, when you involve your whole team, then no one can necessarily pull rank. They really gave him a lot of accolades because he kept it together. But what Captain Sully did was make sure that everybody knows that the flight attendants had not done their jobs, if the people in the hangar had not done their jobs, if the people that were in the control traffic tower had not done their jobs, then that plane would not have been able to land the way that it landed. After it landed, they gave him a tough time. They gave him a lot of ridicule. Um, but still, sometimes people just don't see the lives that were saved. They focused in this movie on the risk that he took. And I want to talk to you as a leader. There are some risks that you will take. And when you take those risks as leaders, it's extremely important to know that that's why you're a leader. First of all, leaders, you do things first. Okay? And then you take the risk. And then ultimately, you're there to help. And those of you that are going to be leaders and your jobs, I want you to understand, do you take the risk? You know, do you get there first? And are you really, really there to help? I want to show you uh, now a, a picture. Look at this picture. I want you to see this picture. And this is something that I like to have fun with in our, in our teams around here. And I believe that some, some of us that are veterans at working, some of you that are new at working, some of you that will be promoted later, if the people in your job consider you valuable enough to want to make another move with. Here's my question. You see all of these, and I'm going to try not to say them right away. Here's the question. What do all of these have in common? Okay. What do all of these have in common? What do all of these have in common? There's a question. What do all of these have in common? Okay. What do all of these have in common? Here's the answer. Reliability. Reliability. You can rely on that horse. Okay. You can rely on that car. And you can rely on that plane. Now, those of you that are listening tonight, I want you to decide who you are. Are you the horse? Are you the car? Or are you the plane? They are totally different. One's an animal. One can travel on land. The other can travel on land just a few miles, and then it's got to take to the air. They all have power behind them, and they all can be extremely dangerous. But the reason I have those here is because each of these uh, in the picture, you can depend on them. So as a person who wants to pursue a job, stay on a job, here's my question. Can the people that you work around can they depend on you? Are you reliable? Are you reliable? There's nothing as frustrating as getting on a horse that's going to buck you. It's a horse. But can you depend on that joker to not buck you? There's nothing worse than having and having an, em an employee who, who's got the job, looks good, comes to work, super pretty, super nice, super handsome, super sharp, but is bucking the whole time he's in shits at work. Nobody wants to get close because you never know what you're going to run into. You never know what, the, you know. Uh, uh, and so, and so you, you, you get that horse because you know that whenever you get on and saddle it up, it's going to get you from one point to the other. And you never really think about being bucked. That car, there's nothing as frustrating as getting in the car and you've got to be somewhere in five minutes. And you, no, you got to be somewhere in 30 minutes, but you realize, you know, my car is fast so I can go through a traffic but you get in and it's like, <laughs> man, that sounds like the Leland Lloyd mobile. It's just, you can just, <laughs> you can just rely on that car to not start. When you got to leave two hours early because you know your car might not make it, you know, it's just not that reliable. It's your transportation. But no, so we've all had cars like that. I mean, growing up, man, that's your first car. It just taught you a lot of things. But that in that plane, there's nothing 
worse than getting on a plane. And you, if you get a chance to talk to the captain, you go, hey, we're going to have a good fight. And he said, dude, I really don't know. <laughs> you know. I'm praying just like y'all. You will probably go, no. So what's the difference between that and you as an employee? And I just want to keep this real for a few minutes. You know, are you reliable? Sometimes coming out of, oh my God, coming out of COVID. I'm trying to talk and teach and not preach, but this is amazing. Coming out of COVID-19, we've asked God for a lot of blessings. And God is saying, can I depend on you to be blessed? You know, uh, one thing I've experienced are people have been off work for a long time now. As a matter of fact, we have spent more time working and in our cars than we have in our homes. However, because businesses have closed and people are working from home, now we've gotten accustomed to being more at home than around people. And so at some point, maybe we're not looking forward to being in the workplace. I've heard a lot of businesses have completely shut down. Churches are completely closed. But whoever you are and whatever you're doing, here's my question. Are you reliable? Now, if you're part of the work chain, what weakens that chain? Let me go into an area now that uh, I think is extremely important. Um, I think that one of the ultimate goals of a leader in life, to me, is to destroy the dependency of people around you. Uh, and that sounds kind of rough, but as a leader, I want to be able to destroy people depending on me. I want to be able to totally destroy that so that when I'm not around, those people, that team can feel totally responsible without me being there. Now, that sounds probably very cruel, but I believe every mother and father who ever taught a child how to ride a bike, they start out with training wheels. But it's something a little different, man. When your son's 26 years old going down the street with a 10-speed with training wheels on it. Somebody's going to say, <laughs> you know, dude, you know, no, no. Well, you know, we're not laughing at anybody. It's possible. So if you're still a training wheel rider, hey. But at some point, somebody would say, dude, can we take the training wheels off? You want that person to be able to ride that bike and not be dependent on those training wheels. So as a leader, that's kind of like what we want to do, okay? Um, and I'm just going to say this. You're a great leader to me when they don't need you anymore. Not when they don't want you, but when they don't need you. So you spend a lot of time realizing I've got to make sure that I pour into people so they are empowered and not just so that they think I have power. What weakens the chain? Let's go to the job place for a minute. I'm going to bring something up. If, you, if you've ever been into um, a job and someone's been there for a long time, what could weaken that job are what I call territorial issues. Okay? Territorial issues are, let's just have fun for a minute. You work in a job where there is a kitchen, but you forget it's the company's job, and you think you own the pots and pans. <laughs> Those are your pots. Those are your pans. Those are, those are your forks and those are your spoons. Uh, territorial issues. Uh, now everything is virtual. Let's say you walk into a situation and someone says, that's my computer. That's my camera. That's my Zoom connection. When we get into territorial issues, we like to think things as ours. And that can weaken chains. Yeah. Remember, you're trying to impact your value. And sometimes people don't necessarily want to work around you because there are territorial issues. And that makes it difficult for some people to work with you. Now, when you have territorial issues, um, well, th they lock people out. Okay? <laughs> because you just don't want everybody, let's say you're in the kitchen. You just don't want everybody in the kitchen. So some people don't have good at Also, territory issues lock some people in who might need to be out of the kitchen. Imagine a person on the job. Imagine you on the job. And by now, you have gotten so locked into it that you're not producing anymore. You're just there. And it depends on the culture of, of where you work. You know, um, do you still have the vision of that job? Do you still 
find yourself valuable? Do they have you see the value in you? Are you the weakest link because you want to own the territory of it and you don't want to say, hey, let me help you to move forward. Now, what most people realize is once you start working on a job, there's a word associated with it. It's called work. See, that's that one word, boy. If we could just go to paid, but instead of work, <laughs> see, work is, work is amazing. Work, work strains muscles. Work strains relationships. Work strains your brain, your mind. And sometimes work, even if you're, and I say even, my goodness, I sure don't mean just even like that. But sometimes it looks like a person not working. They're at a computer. They're having to use their mind a lot. Uh, one mistake uh, could send something in a total different area. There's, there's work involved. And so another thing that could loosen or weaken the chain in leadership with your job, if you're trying to produce and get to another level, and I know I'm going fast, but I'm trying to put all of this into us because that's what we're here for in Dream Church because y'all tend to listen fast, okay, is, is what I call trust issues. When you have trust issues, that can weaken the chain. Um, I don't think, and I've said repeatedly, that anybody should ever go to work or on a job and feel threatened when they go to work. I don't think you should ever go to work thinking about getting fired. I don't think people should go to work and have a fear that today if I don't do right, I'm going to be fired. Now, if you're ever terminated and you didn't know it was coming, you had a terrible boss. Anybody that's ever terminated from a job, you knew it was coming. You, you, you've been knowing it for six months. As a matter of fact, you wake up every day thanking Jesus, Lord, they didn't do it today. <laughs> because, hey, God, you gave me grace today. I got by, you know, you, you know you're just not keeping up with it. But on a job, you want to feel safe. You want to go in knowing that they're trying to do some things to make you feel protected, make you feel valuable, make you feel as if you're, they're going to do everything possible to make sure that your job is done well, to train you, to overtrain you. And at some point, if you cannot get it together, then that could be a wrong place for you. A young person moving into a job, uh, trying to over dominate or how can I put it? Uh, maybe take over um, and, and you don't have the tenure. You haven't put it, you haven't had the experience yet. Uh, yeah, thank you, Brother Billy. Yeah, you come in making demands and you're not in demand. You need a job. They don't need you. They hired you. And in COVID, you just need a job. I saw at a, um, what was it yesterday? I think it was a Brahms ice cream place. Everybody in there, everybody in there seemed like the youngest person may have been 78. All the employees were just older than I was. They were just older than I was. They needed a job. They didn't want to be, they didn't want to be, and I didn't hear one person complain about, why do people want a hamburger? They were so grateful to be working. When you have trust issues on a job, people usually stop trusting because they don't understand and then they don't ask. I don't trust them anymore. You know why? You don't understand what's going on and you didn't ask what was going on. <clears throat> and when you did ask, you asked the wrong person. Sometimes because you ask, if you don't ask the person on a job who knows the answers, you're going to get a wrong answer and you still won't understand. And then you'll say, I don't trust people. You know why you don't trust people? Because you don't understand what's going on and you don't ask questions. And when the questions don't match your answers sometimes, it could be that you ask the wrong person. And usually you don't trust because you don't. You don't understand what happened. You heard one side of a story, or didn't even hear the side of a story. You heard an angle of a story, drew a conclusion, and it could cost you your job. Now, let me tell you about this. People who don't trust, though, are very contagious. When there's distrust on the job, it's very contagious. So one of the things I want you to understand as you are learning tonight, and we're going forward in this wonderful session of leadership, and, and how are we going to reset after COVID-19, is I think that you should understand that a leader's job is to say, this job is too important to put in the wrong hands. When you work around children, when you work around adults, when you work around senior citizens, um, you can't be a fireman and can't stand heat. 
Well, I want to drive the truck, but I'm not going to the fire. See, when you're a fireman, you have signed up to actually, you know, if you ever saw a fire, people pull up when there's a fire and they pull over to look. But that fireman pulls over and runs to the flame. Just remember that. That's just something good. Those are nice commercials that are out now advertising that while wow, Ford decided to build a truck that could not only get the firemen, watch this, not only get the firemen, and this is my conclusion, I didn't hear this, not only to get the firemen to where the fire is, but a truck that can withstand the heat that comes from the flame. You ever thought about that? Sometimes the flames are so hot, what if the vehicle caught on fire? So they have to build their cars or trucks to me, fire trucks, so that the fireman can depend on the truck withstanding the heat. This job is too important. Wherever you work, you got to say it to put it in the wrong hands. Another thing that I think weakens chains on jobs that we just don't talk about are what I call trite issues. These are things that just don't seem that important, so you don't kind of bring them up. But if you let them go on too long, it can rot, um, it can rot the bottom out. Okay, um, I think sometimes, you know, you have to develop sort of a different way to say things early in different relationships. Let's say you're just married and she made a casserole or he made a casserole. Lord, I don't want to make it look like it's just a woman's job. He makes a casserole. Somebody made a casserole. <laughs> and so when they made that casserole, one person said, how was it? And just trying to keep peace, you said it was fine. And guess what you're going to have next Wednesday? Casserole. Another casserole. And then the next Wednesday, what? Another casserole. And on your birthday, what is it? Another casserole. And you keep seeing it stacked up in the refrigerator because no one's eating. Why? Because it built up. And sometimes little issues, when you allow the petty stuff in your life to become the priority, those are trite issues. Those are trite issues. Sometimes they're just extremely petty. Um... And I just, I don't, I don't know what's petty on anybody's job, so I don't want to say that. But if, if you keep, if you just keep talking to yourself long enough, because when you have trite issues, those are things that are going on. And sometimes in your mind, you go home, you think things through, you ride in traffic, you think things through, you take a break, you think things through. They're not that big of a deal, but all of a sudden you might start to think that people don't like you. They have something against you. And all of a sudden, if you keep talking to yourself too long, those trite issues will slowly kill you. We've all done it. We've all talked ourselves out of a lot of things because we allowed a lot of real small, unnecessary issues, I think, to maybe just destroy us. And we talked ourselves out of it. Um, when my grandson was about three or four years old, I used to make sure that he understood that making a mistake is a part of something great that happens during the day. Uh, and I can always tell when people have come from a, an environment bec that's not necessarily um, a pleasant environment because whenever the boss or somebody wants to have a meeting, they panic. What happened? Um, so I remembered some of his first, and I don't really remember specifically, some of the first thing that he started to do, uh, drop a glass, spill some milk, uh, knock over a picture, break a plant. And at some point, he started to understand, maybe because of the reaction from the adults, that I just did a bad thing. And I remember when I started specifically, and I don't take credit for his well training, his grandmother and mom has done a great job and the rest of his family, everybody does a great job with him. But I remembered when I started to teach him that everybody makes mistakes. And he was just beginning to learn how to talk. And so when things would happen, if he dropped some water and I go, hey, what happened? And so he would say this, he would say, Everybody make mistakes, and that's what he would know, okay? He would always say, everybody make mistakes. So we have been off also probably in the process of trying to make a little book on forgiveness to realize that everybody 
make mistakes. Every one of us. And the key is if you are in a working environment and you can't make mistakes, the issue is you're going to make mistakes anyway. You're just going to lie about them because we all get it wrong on jobs. We're around people who change. We're around situations that change. And this whole lesson tonight has been more not necessarily about um, the people you work with, the people you work for, the people that, and I just, I like the word work with. I don't like anybody working for me. But the people you work with, can they depend on you to be reliable? Reliable. And when you're reliable, and I'm not going to get into a sermon, boy, but there's an anointing that comes on your life that says, you know, God has placed me in a position here. Maybe this is just my springboard. And sometimes you wonder, why can I get any higher? Because right now you don't have the patience for what it's going to take at the next level. So you develop that patience right away. And um, that's, that's the lesson right now that we've been talking about tonight on just reliability. How important is it? What is it that God could use you to do that could bless other people? We're going to see if you guys have any questions or comments. I want to, as we get ready to wrap this up, I have a, been blessed to have a great group that meets with us here. Um, and I've, I've said a lot, and I said a lot fast, and I intended to say a lot fast because we don't want to always drag this one on. We want to let these sessions be about an hour apiece. But if any of you would like to come in on something or have any questions about these things, um, Week in, week out, mainly we're here because we keep setting a model that this is a dream church. And dreams always start eh, kind of in different places. So sometimes people are looking at you and they're going, hey, I've seen those people before. That's reliability. We, we always want to start something new. But can we last after the newness wears off? Anybody want to say anything before we dismiss today? Anybody ever run in a relay before? Oh, I'm going to talk about that. For a second. Go ahead. You're about to say something. Um, I just wanted to say I like the note um, where you added trite issues. Yeah. I feel like that is important. And not only does that apply in the workplace, but that also implies in real life situations. If we allow petty to become our priority, it will eventually, you know, it will start to kill us. It will start to kill our mood, our emotions. It also starts to affect our mind and the way we think. Wow. Anybody else? These are good thoughts. Mm -hmm. You said a few things from the standpoint of the leader or almost the boss. Um, and so I had a few things in terms of the employee, mm. um, their reliability and how their bosses can rely on them. And I had a few notes for that. Mm -hmm. um, they're looking for someone who, instead of necessarily being the person looking for the easy job or the easy way out, they're looking for that employee that can find ways to make the job easier. Um, they're looking for someone who can inspire others to sort of step it up, right. not in a competitive right. sense, but because of their work ethic. Right. Um, they're looking for, for a person of integrity. Y'all so, keep listening to that. This is great. So someone that they can trust to perform the exact same way or even better in their presence or their absence. Um, they're looking for a willing worker, of course, someone willing to do the work. And someone who can improve the climate, culture, and productivity of that workplace. Um, That's good. Now, so you're speaking as the employee. I hired you. Mm -hmm. Here's a question. Why would I hire you? Now, that's not a trick question. The answer is real simple. Because I depend on you. Did y'all see the look on Jerry Jones' face the other day when Dak Prescott's leg was broken? Dak was in pain, but Jerry Jones was in agony. He was hurting worse because he realized I've invested in someone because this is someone that I know is going to carry out leadership in our team. But accidents happen. When a person hires you, they're really, now, now hear me closely, everybody. You may say, well, I don't like my boss and I don't like, you know, I think something's wrong with you if you keep complaining about the chef, but you keep eating in the kitchen. Let's just say that. <laughs> but um, uh, your boss, your leader, hired you to help hold them up you got to understand that 
I don't want to hire anybody who's going to be too weak for what happens at the level that I'm saying. Hold my letter. You hold me up. You help me to stay strong up here because it's kind of thin at the top. So why would you want somebody holding your ladder and you need them to really hold your ladder, but the whole time they're fussing about it, got one hand in their pocket, you know, got to take 15 breaks, so you got to stop. Or here's, a, here's, a, here's an illustration I've, I've always used before. I'm at the top of the ladder, and the higher I go up and I'm trying to work on something, I might talk a little louder. I can't have someone ultra sensitive at the bottom of the ladder because that person will go, why are you hollering at me? Because I'm higher than I was before. I'm doing more. So I got to make sure that you're sensitive enough to not be so sensitive. If you walk in a house and somebody lights a cigarette and the fire extinguisher goes off, you need to check the sensitivity level. That thing is too sensitive. So, so sometimes, you know, those of us working on jobs, man, your sensitivity level is just bring it down. Bring it down. Too many things get on your nerves that really should pass by you. Um, so, so thank you for that because that is extremely important. Anybody ever ran a race before? I talked about that a minute ago. Let's close it out with that. Um, when we started the Dream Church, I had to make sure that everybody understood what we were doing. Uh, this church started out as a Dream Church. And it was not the nightmare on Elm Street. It was a little bit closer. It was just like, <laughs> what's happening here? And so God started to let me know in my heart real quick. You got to start identifying somebody young that you can pour into for the next 20 years. 20 years. And I remember that. And I remember trying to build character and strength and responsibility and care and love into the hearts of young people who may have thought it was just fun and games or we didn't care. And now the world is looking for that kind of an employee. Um, so I realized then we were having to get ready to run this leg, this race. So here we were running. I want to close with this. and You guys remember this. You run in a race. And all you do when you're running a race is you take the baton in your hand and you're running. And all you're responsible for is running your leg. But when you finish running your leg, and this is hard, but you got to be willing to hand that baton off to the next person. You may have built this tremendous lead, and you know Tyrone is sorry as all I do. <laughs> but you, you run as hard as you can and get it out there as far as you can. And you got to be willing to hand it to lazy Tyrone. Tyrone may run his leg and halfway through he want to wave at his mama and <laughs> daddy. You know, Tyrone is the kind of person, he's always complaining. His leg hurt, his foot hurt, his head hurt, all while he's running. But at the end of that race, when you all win, you got to realize you needed all four legs. And... Um, it's important that we all win. It's important that we all maintain our jobs. It's not important to just win your leg. But the most important thing is that you pass the baton. You did great on your leg. You did great at your time. You did great on your lap. But if you don't pass the baton, you did it for nothing and you failed. Sometimes a team wins and no one knows who built the lead. Sometimes you were not able to do as good as you would have at other times. But when you step in the winner's circle, you're all in the winner's circle. So we're going to keep talking about this because during this COVID race, some people are not, they're running their leg, but they're starting out behind. <sighs> they get sick. They get weary. They get tired. They get discouraged. But the one thing they didn't do was, oh, they didn't drop the baton. Didn't pull their weight, didn't go as far, didn't get a big gap, but at least he or she held on to the baton. I want to challenge you as we go through COVID-19, I buck, hold on to the baton. No one is knowing how many people drop off from church, how many people quit, how many people said, I, I got tired, I, I just couldn't handle it anymore. But everyone will be able to say at least I held on to the baton. 
And at some point when you realize that I'm not strong enough to make, help us win, it's your responsibility to say, I can't run at this pace anymore. Instead of saying, we can keep losing with me on the team because my heart is right, but my ability has failed. Sometimes you just realize you're shining like a new horse. You're strong as a new car. You got the wingspan as a new plane, but you're running in the wrong race. That plane does good in the air, but you put it on 635, it's not going to do good. That Mustang is great on 635, but you take it across the Pacific Ocean, it's going under. That horse is excellent with a saddle on, but if you run that thing down the freeway or put it on the railroad track, it's not going to do it. Everyone has a place to run their race. And God built every one of us with the ability to do what he has given us to do. So we have started this dream church and we're going to keep moving with it. And we're going to carry this baton. So there may be nights that we come at six o'clock and you go, hey, where's Pastor Rush? He's sitting right over the corner. Why? Because now he's passing that baton. Because we train the next generation of leaders to be able to function and not to be dependent upon us. And that's when you know you're a good leader. If you only lead through your generation, and if you're only concerned about what you did when you were alive, you were a disgrace to your generation of leaders. The respect, the conduct, the character, the conversations, the competency, and the Christ-likeness that comes with us should be passed down to that next generation. Thank you, Father. and for being bold and unashamed. Looking for even more content from Ibach and Pastor Ricky G. Rush? Make sure you're following Ibach and Pastor Rush on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For even more info right at your fingertips, the new mobile app is available for iOS and Android in the iTunes and Google Play stores. And don't forget that an important part of accomplishing God's mission are the tithes and offerings we receive from faithful viewers just like you. Won't you make a difference and become a fisher of men, supporting the ministry work of IBOC and helping us change thousands of lives all over the world? Visit us online at ibachchurch.org or on our mobile app to make your donation. You can also give through Givelify in just a few short steps. Thanks for your support. That's it for now, but be sure to tune in next week for another powerful message from the Master Illustrator, Pastor Ricky G. Rush.